So, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, very pleased to see all of you here. Um, really appreciate that, that you show up for the final stages of, uh, of Brucon here today. Um, we're going to talk today about curation, threat intelligence curation. Um, but maybe just first a bit about our, us. So I'm Michel Kuhne, I'm the head of incident response and threat intelligence at Enviso. In addition to that, I'm also an instructor for SANS. I teach the uh, SEC 599 course, which is a purple teaming course. I'm joined here today with my colleague, Robert. Hey, I'm Robert Nixon. I work at Enviso with Michel and I head up the threat intelligence department there. All right. So. What are we going to talk about today? We're going to start a bit with the problem statement, the problem statement of bad threat intelligence that we all get into our feed. We'll, uh, we'll talk about some examples and we'll talk about, okay, what's the procedure that we created or thought up um, to make sure that whatever we have as an end product, that it contains as little false positives as possible. After that, we'll also talk a bit about our lessons learned. What are some of the key things, if you want to do that for your, your own organizations, what are some of the key things that you want to take into account that perhaps sometimes we have lost sight of eh, and that we would uh, advise you not to lose sight of. Uh, and we'll also talk about our roadmap because it's not done yet. This will be an everlasting project, constant improvements, constantly improving how we do the curation in itself. And then we'll have some times for questions and answers. Hopefully, the answers. Now, before diving into curation itself, let me very quickly introduce MISP for the people who are not aware what MISP is or uh, why you would use uh, MISP. MISP is a um, malware information sharing platform. That's what the uh, ANL stands for. It's a threat intelligence platform. So you can store your indicators, your IOCs in there. Uh, you can store information about financial fraud in there. You can store information about malware samples. Uh, MISP malware information sharing platform. Um, you can store all kinds of information in there and then use it within your own organization. Of course, um, you can also use it to share it's what it was intended for. By the way, anyone knows where MISP was created first? Belgium, yeah. absolutely. Yes. <laughs> so something to be really proud of. Currently, it's maintained by, uh, by Circle, and they're doing an awesome job uh, really improving it, building new capabilities. We'll talk about some of those new capabilities as well that really help us as threat intel analysts, and that really help us to share threat intelligence with everyone that we want to. Of course, that also brings us to the exact problem. Now, maybe just a show of hands here. Eh? Who is involved in the threat intelligence within the organization who works with threat intelligence feeds? Maybe as a SOC analyst, you get in threat intel feeds and you get those IOCs. Okay. No. No. All right, quite a few people. Okay. For those people specifically, have you ever seen an indicator like this in your threat intel feed? <laughs> right? 8.8.8.8, .8 Google DNS. Could be something else, 127001, something we come across quite frequently as well. And that, of course, within MISP, you have then the two IDS flag enabled, meaning that if you send that, if you export it, this IOC will be exported and will be sent to your SOC, to your automation tools, or anything else there. Now, if you send something like this to your SOC, what happens? Like, all alarm bells go off. Hundreds of incident tickets are created. The next reaction is that Robert or myself, we get a phone call. It's like, what have you done? Why are we getting all these tickets? Why do you give us this bad intelligence? Like, this is super obvious, isn't it? So that's the problem that we were facing about a year and a half, two years ago, um, quite frequently, because we are connected. We're with our MISP, we're connected to various different sources, uh, open source uh, sources through Circle, uh, but also more closed sources. Uh, also, we ingest from, um, from commercial sources, threat intelligence. I will tell you, even with commercial sources, people who have seen it, you will also face something like that. Even within commercial sources, it can happen that there are false positives present in the indicator of compromised feed. So, what happens then? You get some garbage within your threat intel feed. Now what do we do with threat intelligence? We try to enrich it so we get enriched garbage. We of course also want to correlate that with all kinds of other threat intelligence so we get correlated garbage. 
Then we see some garbage, we get a sighting because our SOC says, oh, we've seen this, we have a trigger, we have a hit, so this is indeed an indicator that flagged something within our environment. So we have a sighting on our garbage, which leads to an inflating balloon of garbage. This is not what we want. So we started thinking, okay, how can we improve upon that? So the first thing that we did was look within our own organization, okay, who are the producers and the consumers of threat intelligence? It's important to know, John talked about this just earlier in the previous presentation, talking to your consumers of threat intelligence, talk to the producers, understanding their intelligence requirements as well. So that's what we did. And within Enviso, the company that we work for, we have three main teams that uh, use threat intelligence. It's the MDR team, it's the CSERT, and of course, the threat intel team itself. They all, with Within our organization, this might differ for your organizations, of course. Within our organization, they're all producers and consumers at the same time. Looking at our MDR team, uh, of course, SOC monitoring. Threat and tell feeds doesn't need explanation. If they see something, if they get uh, a phishing email, I talked about phishing earlier this morning. If we get a phishing email, we have some indicators that we can extract from it. It's like sender IP address, we have URLs, maybe some IP addresses, all those types of things. We also want to put that into our threat and tell database because then we can go to our other clients or just for in the future when we see this happening again or we see someone click on that URL, we can start correlating, we can start taking action on that as well. So they create threat intelligence in that way as well. Also use threat and tell for threat hunting. For the C-cert, very easy, we use threat and tell in all its various forms to do instant response. We do malware analysis, so we feed back there. Uh, we use it for compromise assessments and a lot more. For our threat intelligence team then, well, they do everything around threat intelligence. So some examples here on the slide, uh, creating threat intelligence briefings, create the feeds or uh, upgrade the feeds, let's put it like that for our SOC and all kinds of other things. So lots of work to be done around that threat and tell. So of course we want to have good data, data that we can trust. In the first step that we took to solve, partially solve the problem of uh, bad threat intelligence or false positives, we started with creating a, I like to call it a MISP ecosystem because it sounds fancy. It's a collection of four MISPs, so it's not that fancy, it's just ecosystem sounds good. So there we have our edge MISP. This is where everything enters. All of our feeds, they all enter in our edge MISP. So this is the trash can, you can call it like that. On this one, we will do our curation. We will make sure that the data that goes from there towards our central MISP, that that is the clean data, that that's already clean. So this is our single source of truth. This is the central brain for our threat intelligence itself. We went a bit further, as I said, we have four MISP instances running currently uh, because we have a separate one for our C-cert, we have a separate one for our, uh, for our SOC. Why? Because, well, we sent all the data from the central to the SOC. Um, and they then can use it in various ways. They can also feed back the data in that MISP. But then, because we want to have that central one as a single source of truth, we're also going to curate whatever is coming back from the SOC. We have good SOC people, but still, it's a good idea to have a look at, okay, what are we going to feed back there? Accidents happen, mistakes can be made. From the CSERT side, uh, we decided to get a fully separate one as well, because, well, of course, uh, we cannot share everything that we do in terms of incident response cases with the rest of the company or with other clients there. So we decided to split all of that up. Now that's an architecture. Does architecture solve our problem at this point in time? No. Not really, we're gonna need a bit more because we still have those false positives. We still get uh, events in with, uh, that are on the, the warning list, the MISP warning list, we'll talk more about that in a bit. Um, we also get events that don't have context. We have some here on the slide, there's no tags. Within MISP you can use tagging to say, this is this kind of event, it's PLP wide, uh, it's related to a certain threat actor, X, Y, and Z. Um, so contextualization, what is this event about? They can easily see it. Also inconsistencies. We try to use as much automation as possible. If you're doing automation, what do you need? You need consistent data to begin with. If we say we're going to send only TLP-wide indicators, 
to our SOC, just as an example. Well, as you can see here on the slide already, there is five different ways of saying oh, this data is TLP white. How is our automation going to do that? It's very likely that we're going to miss a large portion of the data at that point in time. So we want to normalize all of that uh, as well. And the last one, we need to think about, okay, is this actionable? The events that we get in, are they actionable? An event with 80,000 IOCs, 80,000 IP addresses, is it actionable? Can you do something with it? But yes, yeah, you can send it to your firewall and block all 80,000 IPs. <laughs> is that going to end well for you? Probably not, right? So do you know about, uh, for each of those 80,000 IP addresses, do you have all the context around them? Why is this IP address here? Probably not. So those are also things that we will think about during our curation procedure. So practically speaking, what do we do? Three main things. We remove false positives. Sounds easy, right? It's like we remove false positives, we're done, that's it. No. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. We do it, uh, we try to do it in a bit of a clever way. Um, clever way, not invented by us, to be honest, but the warning list, we use the MISP warning list, so Circle, uh, and the community has, has created warning list. RFC 1918 IP addresses, eh? 192, 168, 0.1. If that's in your IOC list, then you're going to get a warning saying, okay, there's an RFC 1918 IP address here. If there's a Cloudflare IP address here. There's something else. So you can already visually see, oh, something's happening here. I do need to investigate a bit more. Another thing that we do with those removing false positives is creating our own custom warning list. When we send something to the SOC, as I said, we're not perfect. So it happens that we send a false positive uh, to the SOC. It's probably not 8.8.8.8, .8 .8 but could be something else. Um, our vision is, or our idea is, we can fail, but we can only fail once. So if we send something bad there, we want to prevent that that bad thing shows up again the month after. So we created custom warning lists, and the SOC themselves say, when they say, ah, this is a bad indicator, this is the reason for it, we add it to the custom warning list so it will never end up within our MISP infrastructure uh, again. And of course, we have the analyst judgment. There is some manual work. I said we do try to automate as much as possible, but there is some manual work to be done there as well. So we have our analyst judgment, uh, and they will be mainly involved in the following steps here. For example, adding contextualization. I'll give you an example. If you get in an event, and it says fishing mill, fishing mill and then you have the different indicators there, you have a... Uh, a subject line, you have two URLs, and you have an IP address. That's it. You send that to the SOC, and then they get a hit on that IP address. They see, oh, this is an IP address related to a phishing mail. What's the action that they're likely going to take? They're going to kick off your phishing playbook. Right? Is that the right action to take at that point in time? We don't know. Because it could indeed be the IP address of maybe the server that was used to send that email, could be the IP address of the URL that was then clicked, but it could also be the IP address that's already reached in a few further stages where the user already downloaded some malware on disk and that started then communicating with the C2. Might be the C2 IP address as well. You need to have that context. You need to have that context as an analyst to decide, okay, what action am I going to take here right now based on what I'm seeing? Because the actions that you're going to take for a phishing email, someone that clicked on a phishing link, versus there's active command and control communication, it's going to be wildly different, of course. So we want to add context to all our events, preferably to all our IOCs themselves as well. So what are we going to add? We're going to try as much as possible add MITRE attack um, tags to everything, say, okay, where are we in the kill chain? Uh, talk about threat actors, what threat actor are we looking at? Is this a ransomware group? Is this a nation state maybe? Is this just a hacktivist? Something like that. Um, going to whoops, add all kinds of other information, as much information as we actually can there. Also add some mandatory TLP tagging, uniform TLP tagging, so that our automation can, of course, work with that again as well. And then as a last step, we're going to verify our event. 
Is it relevant? Is it useful? Did, were we able to add sufficient context on the event? Okay. Is it an event with 80,000 IP addresses? Uh, probably going to push it aside and not ingest it at that point in time. Um, also look at, okay, this is an event that comes in as a new event into our MISP, but it talks about the phishing mail that somebody received in 2019. Is it still relevant? Oh, it could be, but it's unlikely. Okay. So might already domain might be reused, all kinds of different things. So we do think about that. That's a bit the analyst judgment that we have there as well. But as I said, we do lots of automation as much as we can, and that's what Robert is going to talk about right now. All right. So in this funnel, you see the basically the some of the requirements that we have for this effort. We're trying to remove false positives. We're trying to add contextualization. And we're trying to ver verify the relevance of the intel that we're given to the SOC. We don't want to be known as the people that just shove dirty intel into the SOC. So how are we going to do this? Well, we started by looking at what can we automate. That's what you should do, right? Look at what you can automate, and then look at what you have to create a manual procedure for. Get your low-hanging fruit. So we wrote some ZMQ scripts that I'll get into in a little bit. We made sure that we were using those warning lists and syncing them from the SOC. So the SOC maintains them, and then we sync them. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And we make sure that we can do those tags in a proper way so that they, when they come into the MISP, they're in a standard format that can be used across all automation processes. So we start with the edge MISP. And inside the edge MISP is where all of our dirty intel comes from. So it's where we send any feed that we don't trust enough to consider it zero false positives. In that uh, edge MISP, uh, MISP uses the ZMQ, uh, pub sub uh, message system. We subscribe, we create a script that subscribes to that ZMQ uh, subscription, and then it listens for events coming in. It unpublishes those events so that it doesn't get synced to your other instances. And then we also mark it with a workflow incomplete tag. And that workflow incomplete tag is the trigger to tell the Intel analyst that there's work that needs to be done. You need to go and look at this event and start your manual curation process. But we also have an automated script that tags the source. So in MISP, you can, it's more of a hub and spoke system. You can have one main MISP that has multiple organizations inside. So we want to know what is the main MISP that that came from. Did it come from first? Did it, you know, what have you? And what is the actual creator organization of that as well so that we can track these events? And then we want to sanitize. We want to make sure that it's having, has all the tags it's supposed to have. And with TLP 2.0 coming out, we're going to have to adjust our scripts. Right now, we're still using TLP 1. But TLP 2.0, you're talking about white to clear, you got amber strict, so we have to do some modifications there as well. And then after the automation's complete, we move into the manual process. So like I said before, we have the workflow incomplete tag, and it's unpublished. So there's no harm, the event's just sitting in the MISP waiting to be actioned. There's also warning lists that we have enabled that Michelle talked about earlier. Uh, uh, the community maintained ones as well as our custom ones. And inside of an event in MISP, it'll have a flag that says, hey, something in this event matches one of your warning lists. And then you can filter your IOCs based on which ones match the warning list. So that gives you a subsection of the bigger event to look at, maybe I should turn these off, or maybe I should delete the individual attributes. And then you add any type of context you can. So from the event, if you can, sometimes you can't, depending on how much data is there, can you add the country that was targeted? Can you add the sector that was targeted? Can you add the malware type? Now, all of this information really helps the analyst if it were to ever fire inside of the SOC. As you can see there, there's some examples like the MITRE attack that we were talking about earlier in different sectors. And then the last thing we do before we hit publish is make sure that if I was in the SOC, 
and one of these attributes fired, would I be able to do something with it? And then we put the workflow complete tag, well, we remove the workflow incomplete tag, we add the workflow complete tag, and we publish. There's a rule inside of MISP where you can say that a tag is required. So without a workflow tag of some sort, the, this event won't publish at all. It'll say you have to have some sort of workflow tag. Now, it will publish with any workflow tag the way it was, but we'll talk about more about how that's been improved in just a few minutes. And then after it's published, it gets automatically sent to the central MISP, where it's then sent on to the SOC. And this is a little bit more uh, deeper explanation of our, or display of our custom warning list. So within MISP, you have the, com the community and circle maintained warning list. So you're talking about your Alexa top 100,000, uh, Cisco umbrella, uh, Florian Ross list of hashes for known um, binaries that trigger false positives, empty file hashes, etc. So the SOC maintains the Nitro one. That's Nitro is our MDR branding. And they maintain those lists inside of the SOC MISP. And we have a script that goes and fetches that warning list, those warning lists, and then replicates it on all of our other MISPs so that we stay up to date with what they've seen. So I don't have to wait for an email. It's already in the MISP. So you do get organizations that share too much bad intel. It happens. They have a bad process. They're not following good uh, work policies, or they don't have a good uh, threat intelligence lifecycle, and they constantly generate bad intelligence. You have to do something about that. The return on investment of the intelligence coming in needs to pay for itself. You don't need to spend eight hours a day curating intelligence and then not doing anything else. So we developed a tracker for bad organizations. If you create five bad events, then you're out, <laughs> basically. So we blacklist your UUID or block list in MISP terms. Once the UUID is put into the organizational block list inside of MISP, those events are no longer extractable via the API. So if the SOC queries their MISP to get indicators of compromise, they won't get any from a block listed organization. And then there's a script that we have that syncs that block list with all our other MISPs so that it stays current. So what have we seen so far? And I'll give you some numbers. So in a little over a year, uh, almost, almost two, almost two years now, we've seen more than 3,492 events, but that's how many we have in the inbound MISP, right? This is, these are numbers from the inbound MISP. That number is lower than what we've actually seen because we've removed some events that were garbage, basically. And we got around 2 million attributes. All of those attributes are actionable or they're aged out. So their IP addresses, they're still in the MISP for historical purposes, for correlation when we get new intelligence in. Have we ever seen this IP before? Have we ever seen this hash before? What was it related to before that it's being used for now? And as you see there in the bottom, we've blacklisted 16 organizations. But if you see the number above, there's 607 unique organizations that have shared intelligence with us at some point in time. So we've only blacklisted or block listed 2.6%. That's pretty good. I mean, for a community, you're doing a pretty good job. There's just a few outliers that you gotta close the door on them. So what are some of the other things that we're doing to help in this mission? So with false positives, we're matching, before the analyst gets into the, the work for the day, about 3 or 4 a.m., depending on the cron job, on which box, on the inbound MISP, we extract all hashes from unpublished events and then match them against the NSRL database. If it's in, and we don't use the NRS, NSRL 
database, the whole thing, it's rather large. We use Circle's hash lookup interface. So they provide a web interface with an API, and it's not just NSRL in their hash lookup database, it's known malicious stuff, it's all types of things for their hash lookup service. But if you look down into the provider fields of the API response, you can select NSRL uh, legacy. So if the API response is, this hash is seen in the NSRL legacy database, we take away that two, ad, two IDS flag, so it's not going to alert if it's published, and we tag that attribute NSRL. Now we don't leave it like that, because there could be, depending on the environment, depending on the tool, what have you, we may flip the, the IDS flag back on manually. But that tag tells us, hey, you might want to look at this. But at least if, if for some reason we don't look at it, it's been defanged, I guess you could say. If it does slip through, it won't alert. And then we also, like I was saying, we sync those custom warning lists with our Nitro MTR service. Aging out of indicators. This is always a big topic. Everybody wants to know what's the magic number, how long should this IP address live, whatever. We go, we go by the last seen date. So from that last seen date, we, we, we're pretty strict. So 14 days for IPs, 30 days for domains, 60 days for URLs. Unless they get into the warning list, what have you, and then they get turned off. Now there is an advanced use case in MISC called uh, decaying models. Now they use formulas based on tagging levels and you can create multiple decaying models based on what type of tagging and attribute it is. So say for phishing uh, IOCs, if you tag the event as phishing and you give it a um, NATO um, admirality code of B, so for trustworthiness, you can set a formula that, that will decay it over time. Now that's an advanced use case. All of your tagging has to be in place. That's something that's really usable within an organization. Now as a, an MDR consultancy, that's a little harder because we can't match that directly up with a single organization. Scraping web sources. So as a threat intelligence analyst, or a SOC analyst, security professional, you're always looking at blogs, secure list blog, you got Krebs shooting stuff off, you're looking at Twitter, all this stuff. Well, one of our freelancers, Kun Venemp, created a web scraper for MISC. And what it does, it go, you can give it an RSS feed or a manual URL in the GUI, and it'll go scrape the page, it'll use MISC built-in HTML to mark down converter, dump that data into the MISP event, and then use regexes to parse the data looking for IP addresses, hashes, URLs, domains, etc. Uh, registry keys. It'll even look for keyword matches for tagging. So if it says this is MITRE ATT&CK TECHNIQUE T1076, it's going to tag it with the MITRE ATT&CK framework for you, done. And then when you come in, it's unpublished. It has all this tagging. The actual website is listed as an event report inside of the MISP event, so an event within of an event, all in markdown with the highlighted bubbles over all your indicators, done. Now, it's keyword matching for these tags, so there may be some instances where you need to take a tag away. So it matched Google, and now it's saying it's a misinformation campaign, but it's just a link to Google. You know, things like that happen. But for the most part, it's done for you. You just gotta validate and publish. And then bulk deleting of events. So sometimes you do have bad events that slip through, or you lose a license for a commercial intelligence feed, and that uh, provider's like, you gotta get all of our stuff out of your, your database. You can't share it anymore. Fine. We have a script that you can configure to search for a certain attribute, a date range, an organization, 
and it deletes all of those events. And then it takes the UUIDs of those events and deletes them on all the other MISPs that are connected to our central MISP. So it cleans up the database. So this is a new feature called workflows in MISP. And we talked about automation, we talked about ZMQ scripts. This is basically something that was relatively uh, added relatively recently, and it's still beta-ish, but it's like having a sore inside your MISP, basically. Automation within your MISP. So there's a little video here, we'll see how I don't have controls to control the pause or anything, but what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna show you how we're gonna create a workflow. So we're gonna go to the administration tab, we're gonna click on workflows. We're gonna select the event publish trigger. So that's gonna trigger whenever you go to publish an event. And we're gonna say, if this event doesn't have the workflow complete tag, we're gonna do something about that. And I told you earlier that it, it would publish the features of the old MISP before workflows. It would publish if, as long as it had any workflow complete tag. It was just a tag required um, checkbox. This is looking for workflow state complete the specific tag. And if it doesn't have that tag, it's gonna add a tag workflow to do add tagging. It's part of the workflow taxonomy that's maintained by Circle. And then it's also gonna add a tag for workflow rejected. So you know, you've, you've pushed the publish button, but this does take a second. It's gotta write to the database, it's gotta go through ZMQ to block or not block. You've moved on. You know, you're doing something else now, you're on the next event, whatever. How, you, how are you gonna know that something was blocked and you gotta go back and fix it? So it's gonna add that workflow rejected tag so that you know something broke or something's not right. And then it's gonna stop execution of the workflow. And it's on a canvas, you can drag and drop. You can even save it for later um, and add to it. So here is an event we created and it has no tags except for TLB clear. And I'm gonna publish it. Wait a little bit for all the magic to happen in the background. Oh, there you go. Added tags. I need to add some tags and I need to, and I see that it's rejected. So I removed those tags. I went through my curation process again, made sure everything was right. And now I'm adding the workflow complete tag. I've done my job. I went through my playbook. I'm done. Now I'm gonna publish it again. Same process saving to the database, publishing to ZMQ. Workflow's triggered, but workflow is satisfied because it sees the tag it's supposed to see, and now the event is published. Now that is a simple workflow demonstration. There's multiple triggers, as you can see there, and multiple modules that can trigger when you try to do an enrichment, trigger when, um, I'd have to look at the list again. <laughs> Any type of transaction you do in MISP can be a trigger for a workflow to fire, and then you can add tags. You can publish it to a webhook, so you want Teams or a Slack notification to go off. You can do all types of things within the workflows for MISP. So, after all of this, what did we learn from doing all of this work? Tooling, you need to make sure that whatever you create is customized to the way you work. You're gonna find stuff on GitHub, you're gonna find stuff on blogs that say, do it this way, do it that way. Make sure you take a look at how you do it now, what your requirements are, what your playbook is, and make sure you don't just copy and paste, oh, we're gonna do it this way now because this guy on GitHub, this is the way he does it, so we're gonna do it like this. Make sure it's customized to your organization. Automate as much as possible, that's obvious. And then extend what is available. Don't always go looking for the next shiny thing that you see in a blog post. A lot of the tools you have within your own organization now have capabilities to help you accomplish your goals. Maybe that switch just isn't flipped. 
or the, uh, the guy who owns that tool didn't turn to that page in the manual because he's his use case is over here and it's done, but it also has other capabilities. Don't be afraid to question what you already have. Next up is everyone's favorite topic as a lesson learned, documentation. Yeah, it is important if you want to run out now. Now is your chance. <laughs> no, documentation, it is important. You have to realize when you're setting up something like this, you will probably not be the person maintaining this until the end of its days. There's going to be someone else. I hope for all of you that from time to time you take some vacation and someone else can take over from you. So you need to document. First of all, the architecture. As we've seen, our architecture is fairly simple. We have four systems. We need to document that. We need to document all of the different flows between those systems. That if, if someone else comes in, in a few years maybe, and I hope it's still running within a few years, uh, that we, well, proven to ourselves that it actually works for a longer period of time. Um, but if someone comes in in a few years and they want to make changes, they need to make certain changes, they need to understand what the current workflows are, how those different MISPs are communicating to each other. So you need to have that documented there as well. Also understand, and we've seen that eh, we do lots of automation in it. Uh, we try to do as much automation, but there's always the part that the analyst needs to do. There's still the analyst that needs to do a final validation, need to add something, needs to add some mitre tags there as well. So make sure that all of that is documented as well. We try to build in some fail saves, like Robert just showed. We build in some fail saves that if you didn't go through your entire checklist, you probably forgot that tag workflow complete. Okay. If that happens, we're not going to publish because there's probably something else that you also forgot. So document that entire process as well. How do you do curation? What are the different actions that you need to take? How can you do certain things? So documentation, yes, absolutely, it is very important. Another thing that we all love so much is communication. Talking to your stakeholders, talking to your peers. As much as we want to pat ourselves on the back and say we're doing an awesome job here, saying, oh, we're, we're doing all this curation and we have zero false positives over the last six months. It's like, sure, but you also only gave us like one indicator of compromise over the last six months, so Jeff, good job to you. So you need to have an interaction there. What do you get from us? Do you get value from the feed than specifically from the IOC feed? Do you get value from it? Talk to the people that you work with, that you work for. Ask them, do you, okay, do you have false positives? If you have false positives, you'll likely hear them say it. But also understand, do you have true positives? Do you actually have hits on the data? Does it help you? Does it help your clients? Does it help your organization? So you really need to talk to them. Understand what their current pain points are with the deliverable that you bring to them. Do you have pain points? How can we solve this? How can we make this better together? So communication, definitely really, really important. Something we must do uh, very often, continuously, let's say. Like I said, this is not done yet for us. We still have a number of things on our roadmap. One of those things is that MISP workflow, as Robert said, still in bit in the, the beta stage, it's very early, it's been released over the summer now. Um, so the workflows themselves, they're still rather limited in what they can do. Our goal is to have all of those scripts that we now custom created for ourselves, um, that we can transform those into workflows. Might be necessary that we create those workflows ourselves, uh, or that we create the, the underlying scripts for that ourselves, that we can then also feed back to Circle. Um, we'll need to see how we do that, uh, but that uh, would make it a bit easier to also share back with the community, and I'll get back to that one uh, in a bit as well. So, um, contributing back to the community. So, we want to help other organizations know that they have a bad IOC in their feed instead of just blocking them. We want to contribute sightings for things we've seen. We want to share our resources and how we matured our processes. So we're starting there, sharing how we matured our threat intelligence process. But with the curation, we want to make sure we're at a level where we're, when we share back, we don't want to be one of those organizations that possibly share back something 
that is makes a lot of headache. But that is one of our goals is to be able to share back with the community on a attribute event level. Announcements. So we did have a plan to create a custom script that did announcements to Teams and Slack, et cetera. Well, Miss helped us with that. So with the workflow feature now, we're going to look at the webhook capabilities. And maybe we don't have to log into Miss every day at 9 o'clock to see if there's an event that needs to be curated. We'll set up a webhook workflow that says, bing, and tell analysts you got an event with a workflow tag in complete, and you need to go take a look. And then finally, open sourcing everything that we've made. So it's our goal also to all the scripts that we created. Again, as I mentioned, they're very custom to us right now. Um, if you want to use this within your organization, you probably need to make them very custom to your organization. But uh, by the end of the year, at the latest, we need to do some cleanup on the scripts. We'll be honest with that. Uh, maybe also add some documentation, uh, eat our own dog food over there. Um, but uh, we will open source that. We'll put that on our GitHub, the link to our GitHub, which is, uh, which is here, and then share it back. And hopefully you can uh, use that within your organizations then as well. That was it for us. Thanks a lot for your attention and for being here. And if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Are there any questions? Who has some questions? Nobody has a question? That means it was all very clear. I don't know. <laughs> and it's all right. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much. And maybe let's have a, another applause for these two great guys. Thank you.